Uh, Brother Thad Jones is on trumpet. Elvin is on drums. Don Moore on bass. George Abend on percussion. And he was then known as Dollar Brand. He's known today as Abdullah Ibrahim from South Africa on piano. And this is Midnight Walk, the title track of Elvin Jones's 1966 album. This is Lead Stories. <laughs> a grateful lead stories. I'm Eutrice Lead, and I am delighted that we can reconnect uh, literally after quite a while. Uh, as you know, we have made the big move. Uh, PRN has moved its offices thanks in great part to uh, our listeners and supporters. It was a great undertaking, and people, of course, stepped up to the plate and got it done. The physical move was one thing, but the electronic move was a whole other thing. And uh, the guts of the operation essentially had to be disassembled, taken to our new location, and then reassembled and uh, interfaced with all the other electronic and, and what do you call it? That interfacing that goes on when you, you're in the business of using uh, the internet and, and other services, and they weren't particularly uh, as, as uh, urgent as we were about getting started Basically, I can't blame them. They, this is a very tedious task, and they just took the time that it had to be taken to get it done. And there we are. So we are today again for the first time in more than a week. Well, I should start off with a wonderful, wonderful, wonderful gathering that we had at the community church in Manhattan on the 27th. It was incredible, absolutely incredible. And I couldn't believe that people came from as far away as Chicago. Henry, that's a reference directly to you and his friends and so forth. Lots of wonderful people who just, just symbolized the spirit of what I was talking about. And it was about reclaiming and rebuilding community because, as I said to them in my talk, I believe that that's our salvation. That is our surefire uh, protection and defense system. When we reclaim and rebuild and return to community. You can tell from what's going on now with the president looking rather <laughs> silly in a jacket that's way too short for him, in a coat, formal wear, by the way, he looks so hysterically funny. As an ill-dressed man, it looked like he just got the call five uh, minutes ago to attend a formal dinner, a state dinner at that. And uh, his wife, the first lady, oh, my God, what a sorry lot. <laughs> I mean, no style whatsoever. No sense of, you know, th that they're used to this kind of thing, that this is, this is their milieu where it is not a big deal, at least in their experience, to be hosted by the Queen of England uh, on a state visit. They look terrible. They do not look like the, uh, the very cultured, very snazzily dressed, impeccably dressed people who previously represented the United States. <laughs> look, they say, hey, hey, Donald. Well, you want to go to uh, Britain and uh, sit down and have a meal with the Queen? Oh, yeah, sure. And <laughs> that's, that's how he got ready. He and his family 
altogether, they looked rather silly. They looked so sad. And from a, even from a fashion point of view, things have gone downhill. You know, you, you always expect the United States, the president and the first lady and their family to be right on point with these things. Because after all, this is part of what a head of state has to do, represent the country. And they all looked like it was the first time somebody dragged out uh, some formal wear and uh, <laughs> told them to put it on and go to dinner. I don't have to ask, okay? I'm not going to ask what uh, uh, boo-boos occurred at the dinner table <laughs> <laughs> do, do they know what fork to use, what spoon to use? <laughs> they look like they just came out of a trailer park and run, uh, they ran into a, a place and got ready real fast, and there they are. They showed up at Buckingham Palace uh, for, for Din Din. It's a sad commentary, but it is another way in which we gauge how far this country has gone down. Even on that level, you cannot be proud of the president and how he and his entourage represent the, the United States. There are people I know who, you know, if you give them a fast call and say, hey, meet me for dinner, they would look a lot better than that. They would look polished. They would look like they're accustomed to functioning at that level. And they would have a coordinated look. They did not have a coordinated look. But, you know, this is not about fashion. This is just about saying these are the things that tell you who you're dealing with. And the president of the, the country and his family, his whole entourage, they're really very crude and unpolished people. And it's unfortunate that it had to be revealed in the country noted for its obsession with, you know, what is right, how to dress, how to eat, all these rules you have to follow. Uh, and uh, there we go. We, we're all writing on Donald Trump's exceedingly short cold tales today. Oh, it looks so horrendous. It looks so terrible. His jacket, his dinner jacket, very, very short. He looked awful. He just looked awful. But anyway, he looked on the outside what he actually is on the inside, and everybody looked like a mess. <laughs> it looked like an uncoordinated mess. Uh, daughter Ivanka tried her best to mimic the English style with a hat. <laughs> you watch these things, and I, for one, I, I, I crack up. Because even, even as a child, and here I, I give thanks to good old Gertrude and Claude. Now, when they got dressed, it was an event in the household. Everything had to be in place. Everything. And nothing is to be missed. So that by the time they leave the home and they're on their way to, uh, you know, a big event, Usually, it involves some representative from the state, uh, but they were impeccable, impeccable. The car was ev shining. Everything absolutely impeccable. Now, they didn't do that all the time, you know, but when they did have to go to formal events and so forth, they understood how they ought to represent themselves because it reflected on our town, it reflected on our family, 
It reflected on all the associations my father belonged to and my mother. She is the, 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 the lady of the house. Let me tell you, on any day that they had to go to, let's say, go to a formal event, they would look perfectly suited to go hang out with the queen. And that is without much fuss and preparation. It's just the way they lived. And that's the way we live. Uh, you lived in a country where these things matter. So you pay attention to them. You have your home clothes, you have your going out clothes, and you have your special occasion clothes. And you are in, in mint condition. And every time you go out, you represent your entire family and your neighbors and your town. We don't think about that. But here we have the president of the United States and his whole family looking totally lost. And these are the elite of our country. These are the, the muck the mucks. They are the muck, the, the super muck the mucks. And they look like they just fell out of a, of a car somewhere and found their way to the palace and they look like a, a hot mess, I tell you. But I wanted to talk about this, and we will concentrate on this for a couple of days. So don't be surprised. And it has to do with us rearranging things. You know, after a while, you're living in the same house, you can, you can be blindfolded and not run into anything because you know the house so well. Then there comes a time, for some reason, you get sick of it. You want to rearrange things. I mean, geez, you know, give yourself a break and upgrade. Give yourself a, a new look. Your house is a new look. Maybe you plant some bushes outside. Maybe you uh, buy a new chair or couch or something like that. Or you just switch the furniture around to get a brand new look. And you add something that makes the whole room look totally new. And we do that because after a while you get fed up of the same old, same old. And I think we are long past that point. We're fed up of this. And we need to do something for ourselves. This is not for the government or for the country or for any. This is for us, each of us. And what we have to do, it seems to me, is to overhaul our approach to politics. Overhaul the whole thing. Because the whole thing is just so wrong. It's so wrong in so many ways. And yet we live with it. Just like the old room full of furniture, we know what's in there, and we can get from the front door to the kitchen without bumping into anything because you know the terrain so well in your house. We got to change it up because we are being really done in. We have suffered immeasurably. Things are getting better. Even when they tell us it's going to be short term suffering, you can, you can hold out, you can hang in there. It will get better. You just help us to move from here to over there, and it will be that much better. And then we do it, and it, it, it doesn't get better. Well, this year, by voting on these issues, 
and you vote on the issues because after all you want things to get better and then they don't but in the meantime while things are not getting better what is really happening is that they're not getting better for you <laughs> They're not getting better for you. They're not getting better for me. They're getting better for the people with money, the people with power, the people with influence. They're getting better and better for them. Things are getting better and better. For you and me, they're not. And the sales pitch comes every time that there is an election. We only need to fix this. We need you to help us get over this hump. And then things will get better and better. You'll see. And I say, enough already. Time to sign off. That mantra no longer inspires me. More and more, what do I feel? Alienated? disenchanted, disaffected, angry. Why? Because in reality, I am suffering. And that was not part of the deal. That is not supposed to be part of the deal. The deal and the promise made is that you do this. You fulfill this part of the equation. We're going to be working on the other part. Together, we will make things better. They don't get better. We look at employment. <clears throat> and we see consistent patterns. The people who are suffering the most are the people who have been suffering the most. The people who have been paying the price for, quote, progress, unquote. Housing. We look at the quality of life. We look at what futures, if any, even if, if we even envision such a thing. What is the future? for our children and grandchildren and your nieces and your nephews and so forth. What is the, their future? Do they, they, they dare hope that their future would be better than the future, than the present that they have now? No, they can't hope that. And then they tell us about wealth. There are more rich people than poor people. So obviously, the people who are rich and wealthy, they're doing the right thing. The people who are poor are obviously doing the wrong thing. <laughs> so in any event, you still get blamed for your plight, no matter what you do. They have a way out. You don't. I don't. So we have to change this. And the first place we start, it seems to me, is to revolutionize our thinking. And it doesn't call for a big thing, a big blow up. It calls for a different way to see ourselves and our place in this world and a place in our world. We have been carrying the burden for a long time. It's time we throw it off. And the safest place for us, it doesn't look like it. It doesn't sound like it. But believe me, it is the answer. And that is to reclaim our community to reclaim a way of life we knew to build and rebuild community 
and to have faith, to have faith in the whole concept of community again. We don't have that. It's been utterly destroyed, which is the reason that we are so vulnerable. We can't react. We can't really organize. We can't defend ourselves because we don't have community. We don't have a sense of community. And it is our best defense. It always has been. When we look objectively at what has happened to our communities, we can see the slaughter, systematic slaughter. In order to erase it, erase communities, to lay waste to them, to fragment them, and in doing so, you utterly destroy the people. Because the one thing they used to have, which is some kind of glue that would hold them together and give them a reason to fashion some kind of a, a response that deals directly with survival. Their survival was a collective effort. We see how methodically that concept has been destroyed. Because ultimately, it would lead to total destruction. Now, what do I mean by community? Do I mean, well, you're living on this block between such and such a street and another street. No, it's not physical necessarily. Although with us, it has been due to, as you know, we live in a, an apartheid country. People knew where to find us. We knew where we should live. But community means a lot of things. It means the physical space, yes. The physical space that we live in, we inhabit that. We are located there. Why there? And if we bother to take a look, even a cursory look, you don't have to go too deep. You will see evidence of people who understood that it was necessary to have a community. Why? Because you show up your defenses, you enhance your security and your survival. You're among people you know. You share customs. You share religious beliefs. You share lineage. You share a language. I understand that as time goes by, there's a little fluidity. People move. But what incentivizes our move? is the wrong thing. We move to get away from community. <laughs> we move to get away. We move because we have to show that we have achieved. We can't live in the same place anymore. We live in a three-bedroom house now. You got to go to a three-bedroom house community. To confirm your upward mobility. That's right. But in moving from your first community to your three-bedroom community with your haughty self, 
you have become so vulnerable, it's not even funny. And you don't pay attention to it because you are paying attention to getting all the, you know, the, the trappings. You don't have time to even examine what did you gain by making this move. So you move to get away. And I'm saying it is the exact opposite that is going to save us. We have to move to get to a bit closer. We have to reclaim what we have lost. We lost it by, of course, by planned attrition. And we lost it by cooperation. People willing to run away, get off the plantation, as it were. But look at the sequential steps. Look at the consequences of each of these actions. We move and we open up the land, available land for people to come in. and say, well, they didn't appreciate this. This is great. You take a, a, a locality like Harlem really beautiful when you look at it. And there came a time that people couldn't wait to get the heck out of Harlem. First, they couldn't wait to get in. Black folks from the South, black folks from the Caribbean, black folks from other parts of the United States, waiting to reach that Mecca. It provided everything, a closeness, a shared religiosity. It provided the goods and services that you need. Really, you didn't need to leave Harlem to get good fish or to mend your shoes. All of that you got right there. Plus, in the morning, you have the Harlem River on one side. You have the Hudson River on the other side. And in the middle, there you are with all these people who dressed so proudly and went to church on Sunday and their children hunkered down when they came home to do their homework. And people were thriving because there was community. There was community. Somebody's sick, neighbors knew. There's a death on the block, neighbors knew. This isn't just, you know, small stuff. This is the very essence of survival and community. And we've lost both. And we are not stopping to take inventory to see how great the loss has been. We've lost a lot. And our only hope for the future, our only hope for survival is to create it again. And be proud about it. Be purposeful about it. Be happy about it. Everywhere in this world, that we have suffered and that people have treated us terribly, murdered us, killed us off, took our land, took all of that. It is because the number one item on their agenda is to destroy the concept of community, the impact of community, even the potential of community. 
We need to understand that. Community is a mighty weapon. Why? Because you can't be apart from community and still be a part of community. You understand? They're two different things. They may sound the same, but they're two different things. It means you have to make an investment. You have to be present and accounted for as a continuing influence in this process of sustaining ourselves and surviving. I remember my aunt who came from Trinidad in the 1900s telling me how incredibly beautiful Harlem was. And she wasn't talking just about the, the, phys the physical Harlem. She was talking about the whole concept of Harlem that everybody got. It is no wonder that we had the Honorable Elijah Muhammad coming up with the phrase, do for self. That's what everybody was doing, do for self. And looking out for others. That's community. Nobody dared go up there and make crazy noise. Of course, Harlem had its share of gangsters and people who didn't do very much good to the community or for the community. We know that. But there was a cohesiveness that brought all these strands together in a locality that they shared and that they were happy to be in. All of this incredible culture, all of our scholars that were produced in Harlem, the education that children were exposed to in Harlem, even poor children, poor people, they took care of business. And so, at a time in the United States where you could see the, the greatest similarity between the United States and, say, South Africa, where your life, your very life, depended on knowing the rules, knowing the rules of this game, you stick together or you fall apart. We've lost that. We have bought into this myth, this illusion, that we are now Americans. What the heck does that mean? We're now Americans. Freedom, justice, and equality. We need not fear anybody. Nobody's trying to do us harm. It is us, up to us to carve our own path to forge our own way and all of that. And we don't pay attention to the fact that the game has shifted. We're still playing the game that we thought was being played. You know, like, I have my degrees now. I qualify just as well as that guy over there for a job. Well, you weren't paying attention. I could move out of here now and go live in the suburbs of New Rochelle. Well, you know, 
they lynch people up there too. And that job that you have is not, as they used to say, is not an iron rice bowl. It would not feed you for life. You can't count on that. Because the reality is, you may have moved up a rung on the ladder. But what kind of ladder have you been climbing? There are people who believe that money is wealth. So they're making more money, you're wealthy. But there's a great difference between what you understand as wealth and what America understands as wealth. And soon you learn that the money you have is just money. It's not wealth. Wealth is what you own. Money is what you earn. Two different things. And we've seen example after example before us. We should by now be able to safely conclude that we're in deep trouble. And the flip side isn't pretty either. It is that we either have run out of time or we are close to running out of time. There are no other answers. Wherever we look, we find leadership lacking and wanting. We find open betrayal. We find people, in fact, be becoming our second level of exploiters. They install themselves as the gatekeepers to our community. They are the self-appointed leadership. And we are the lemmings who show up every election day and we cast a vote for the same people who are betraying us. And we try to convince ourselves, well, we've done our path. We've done our part, sorry. We haven't done our part. We are not contributing to the redirection and the rebuilding and the reconstitution of our communities. And yet our lives, and certainly the lives of those coming behind us, depend on this. It's the only survival mechanism that we have. The only one. And, <coughs> excuse me, my encouragement is that all of us really grip, get a grip on this. and understand how important it is for us to redirect our energy and resources to the communal task of survival. We're acting like we're not in trouble. <laughs> we're acting like, well, you know, if we get into any kind of trouble, well, we're with the rest of the country, you're not. They've got alternatives. You have none. And that is why I'm paying less attention to what's going on with Trump and his administration. Because push comes to shove. They have survival already wrapped up. They know, even if the worst befalls them, they will survive. Why? Because they control the systems of survival. 
we should worry less about them and more about us. We should worry less about what's good for them, meaning that if it's good for them, by extension, it is good for the country. We should worry less about that. In fact, we should dismiss it utterly and entirely from our minds. We should be obsessed with our own survival. This is their politics, has nothing to do with you. This is their chaos, their confusion, their way of running the world, their greed. This is theirs, not ours. We have no business, it seems to me, to be involving ourselves in helping them survive. They'll simply continue to do the same thing. Either they ratchet it up or they ratchet it down, depending. For us, it is always ratcheted. I shared with you some time ago that I stopped voting. And I made that decision, that epiphany I experienced in a voting booth. And I made up my mind that voting for many parts of the population is meaningful. It assures them uh, some control of the, the services they get from tax, uh, the tax levied services they get. And uh, it assures them a continuation of their power and influence and so forth and quality of life and all of that. It assures me nothing. Nothing. I get nothing. Right there in that voting booth, I was mugged. telling me to vote for judges <clears throat> who are unknown, telling me to vote simply yes or no on a multi-million dollar uh, construction project, telling me to approve or not approve more taxes on this and that and the next when you know I have no control over any of this. And I said, no, no. I'm reasonably intelligent. And I'm not going to put up with this insult. I am not going to uh, lend myself over to the overseer on this plantation so they could do what they want to do and all I can do is stand on the side and look but in, in the end I could pay I have to subsidize their plans for their future and their children I'm not going to do it. Right there in the voting booth, I said, I didn't swear that I will never ever vote in life again, but I did say, until I find a reason to vote, until my interests and the interests of my community are accounted for, you could forget it. I have zero interest. And I must say, I have kept that promise. I'm not playing around. I know what you are. I know who you are. I know what your plan is. And it has nothing to do with my survival and prosperity. Nothing. 
So you go ahead and continue that propaganda about, you know, land of freedom and democracy and all this, because all of that has always been for you, not for me, and not for people like me. So it seems to me we have some work to do. And the first part of that work is cleaning up our heads, cleaning up our minds, and really understanding the precarious position that we are in as a people, as a group. Now, people may want to, you know, theorize and whatnot. I'm telling you what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing, and I know you too. You have seen it and experienced it. This is real. This is not a theory. This is real. And it is happening in real time. So we will continue this discussion this week on whether... We choose survival or death. Survival or death. That's the only choice. Now, you may want to die slowly. <laughs> That's not a good choice. Death is not a good choice. It's never a good choice. So, let us focus on this idea of reclaiming, reconstituting, and reviving the only thing I think, the only thing I think that can help us, that can give us the answer to the, the, the multiple dilemmas we face, which is community. We need it more than ever. And we have to fight harder than ever to reclaim it. That's what I shared with the wonderful people who showed up at the community church. And I want to thank the committee for inviting me there, the Global Affairs Committee. And in particular, David Strawn, who you know as David from Brooklyn, he calls her. See, you never know who's calling in. He's a member of that committee, a very valued member of that, community, of that com committee. And I was so, so delighted to be in the midst of other people who are so concerned. But we have to get other people concerned. <clears throat> we are in the midst of a major catastrophe. It's silent. It is killing. It is deadly. And we've reached a point of critical mass on this. We have to do something. We have no choice. So that's the introduction to what we'll be talking about this week. Again, worry less about Trump and whoever comes after Trump and who is his friend and what. Worry less about them. They have their thing already organized. They have everything organized. They even have us organized. That's the problem. We, they have organized us to see to our own destruction. So I'm saying no. I'm hoping that you can think about this and understand the moment that we are in, we are in a perilous moment, and we are called upon to be soldiers for the future of our children, <coughs> excuse me, and our community. Let's get to work. We'll continue tomorrow. Bye-bye.